Hey, you ready to go in deep into Guns N' Roses' album, The Spaghetti Incident? Well, so am I. Let's go get it. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, rock fans. This is your humble host, PJ Pat of the It's One Letter podcast. Thank you so much for joining. Today, I am super stoked to bring you this article from the latest classic rock magazine. And it's about that, I guess I'm going to call it iconic Guns N' Roses album, The Spaghetti Incident. It is really one of a kind. Fun fact, um, even though it was released after the Use Your Illusions 1 and 2, it was actually recorded during the Use Your Illusions 1 and 2 sessions. Also, um, in between touring, they went in the studio and recorded these songs. So, uh, really cool. It's For those of you who don't know, this is an all-covers Guns N' Roses album. And it actually features the first time Gilby Clark, the guitar player that replaced Izzy, on an album. And I think it's the only album, actually, that Gilby Clark officially plays on. So, interesting stuff. There's a lot of fun facts. For those of you who don't know, the Spaghetti Incident, why it's called that way... From my research, there's two stories. Number one, it refers to an incident where Axl Rose got into an argument with Steven Adler and threw some spaghetti on his wall. The other story that I heard was that, um, and Duff McKagan confirms that, um, back when they were living in Chicago, Steven Adler, he used to store his stash of drugs in the fridge next to all the takeouts. And his code word for his stash was spaghetti. Steven Adler ended up suing the band at some point, so there was a lawsuit going on. And Adler's lawyer brought up in court and asked the band about the spaghetti incident referring to what happened. And uh, the band thought that was pretty funny and hence named the album The Spaghetti Incident. Ha, huh, there you go. For those of you who don't know, a little fun fact for you. Okay, so the name of the article is called The Italian Job. Words by Dave Everly. E-V-E-R-L-E-Y. 30 years ago, Guns N' Roses released The Spaghetti Incident. Actually, there's a question mark. I should say The Spaghetti Incident? an album of covers and brought a load of mostly obscure, mostly punk rock tracks to a wider audience. We take a look at the originals that fired up Axel and co enough to want to record their own versions. 30 years after it was released, the spaghetti incident remains the strangest and most misunderstood album guns N' roses released coming on the heels of the blockbusting use your illusion pair. This collection of mostly punk covers recorded during the Use Your Illusion sessions and between dates on the subsequent tour was a curveball from one of the biggest rock bands on the planet. These were all songs we played in soundcheck or live over the years, Guns N' Roses bassist Duff McKagan explains to Classic Rock. There was no plan to start with. We recorded a few songs and then it was like, let's just make a record. Guns N' Roses were a hard rock band with punk rock in their hearts. Duff had played in punk bands The Farts with a Z or Z for my American friends and the Fastbacks in his native Seattle, but everyone was on board. It was Axel who loved the UK subs. He found down on the farm, says Duff. We figured if we make this record and it sells, then if nothing else, some of our heroes can get some royalties. The reviews that greeted the Spaghetti Incident upon its release in November 1993 veered between the perplexed and the hostile. It sold just a million copies in the US. Small change next to Appetite for Destruction, but enough to boost both the profile and the bank balance of those who wrote the songs that GNR had covered on it. These are the stories behind those original songs. All right, song number one, Since I Don't Have You. I believe this was the first release, and what a banger. Composed, written by the Skyliners. The Spaghetti Incident may have been a Guns N' Roses punk rock covers album, and the most punk rock thing they did on it was to kick the whole thing off with an unironic cover of Pittsburgh doo-wop group, The Skyliners' 1958 single, Since I Don't Have You. The song dated back to an era when rock and roll had yet to fully get its claws into America's youth. And in the case of co-vocalist Janet Vogel, billowing dress, the Skyliners look more like trainee accountants than like pop stars, but their version of Since I Don't Have You reached number 12 in the U.S. in early 1959. In a 1993 radio interview, Slash revealed that Axel constantly sang the song when the two of them lived together during GNR's early days. I don't know why I really liked that song. I just did, Axel said, adding Riley, punk rock at its finest. <laughs> okay, New Rose by The Damned. Doesn't get more punk rock than that. It's the greatest recycled intro of all time. Is she really going out with him? First heard in 1964 as the opening of Shangri-La's Immaculate Teenage Death Ride anthem, Leader of the Pack. It was repurposed 12 years later by The Damned for New Rose their debut single, and the first by a British punk band. Dave Vanian, singer, was waiting for the drums to start up, and he goes, is she really going out with him? Original damn guitarist Brian James says of the Shangri-La's homage, 
He says, we didn't even know Nick Lope, the producer, left it in until we heard the single for the first time. Devious or not, it fired the starting pistol for an entire movement. James had written the new Rose riff while he was temporarily living in Belgium with his pre dan band Bastard. The drummer couldn't get his head around it, so I sat on it, says James. He had more luck when he returned to London after Bastard fell apart in 1974. The following year, he began putting together the band that would become The Damned, starting with drummer Rats Gabies, real name Chris Miller. I played that riff and he picked up on it straight away. This was when it was just the two of us. James fleshed out the song in less than three hours in his flat in Kilburn. The amphetamine drum tattoo that kicks everything off came from Scabies. I said, let's have some jungle drums as an intro. And Rat did something totally unexpected. It was crazy from the outset. James's lyrics match a song's musical endorphin rush. It wasn't about a woman, says the guitarist, so much as a feeling. The only thing I can think of is that it must have been about a punk scene. Suddenly, there were a bunch of people who loved the Stooges and the MC5 as much as I did. New Rose was released as a single in October 1976 on Stiff Records, beating the Sex Pistols' Anarchy in the UK by three months. None of us gave a f about having the first punk single, says James. It was only the managers who cared about that. After the Damned's temporary split in 1978, James went on to form Lords of the New Church. In August 1986, the Lords played a show in Glendora, just outside LA. The support act that night were pre-famed Guns N' Roses. All I remember is their drummer had a leopard skin covered drum kit, says James. A couple of years later, they were everywhere. The circle was completed when GNR covered New Rose on the Spaghetti Incident, which James only found out via an article in Rolling Stone. They asked Slash what he'd been recording lately, and he said they'd done a wing song and a new rose. I thought, F hell, I might make some money from it for the first time in my life. <laughs> All right, the song Down on the Farm, one of my favorites on the album, and it's by the band UK Subs. It was the middle of the night in London, sometime at the end of the 1980s, when Charlie Harper was woken up by his phone ringing. A guy with an American accent on the other end of the line introduced himself as Duff McKagan. He was at a party in Los Angeles with the Subs' then-manager, and he wanted to know if it would be okay if his band, Guns N' Roses, covered Harper's band, the UK sub song, Down on the Farm. Sure, said Harper, then he went back to sleep. Originally appearing on the Subs' 1982 album, Endangered Species, Down on the Farm is one of punk's great anthems of boredom. All I need is some inspiration before I do somebody some harm, Harper draws blankly at the start of the track. But this was no nihilistic rant at the futility of life. It was literally about being cooped up on a farm, specifically Jacob's Farm, a residential studio in Surrey. Lovely place, Harper says now, but I was trying to write lyrics for this brilliant music Alvin, the sub's bassist, had come up with and failing. Stuck in a studio while his bandmates relaxed in the farm's pool, Harper began increasingly frustrated. I started feeling really depressed, and that's when it all came along. The finish song barely keeps the lid on its frustration. Boredom eats me like cancer, sings Harper. Adding the coup de grace towards the song's conclusion, everything smells like horse down here on the farm. That was true, he says. There was a stable with horses. Everything did smell like horse. The owners thought it was funny. <laughs> Guns N' Roses' version of the song made its first appearance at the Farm Aid Festival in Indianapolis in April 1990 before they recorded a faithful version. Give or take Axel's Dick Van Dyke London accent. It got a run out on the band's last tour, most notably at the Glastonbury Festival at Worthy Farm where the everything smells like horse line came with piquancy. No idea what that means. If any of you do, please let me know. It's such a simple piece of music, but so effective, says Harper, who has been known to introduce it as a cover of a Guns N' Roses song. The only line that makes him wince now is, I'd rather be back in Soho than down on a farm. That's turned on me now, he says. I'd rather be anywhere else on a planet than there these days. Human Being by the New York Dolls. Yes, a legendary New York band. The New York Dolls' self-titled 1972 debut album is one of the foundation stones of both punk and 80s glam rock. A staggering, slurring missive from the gutters of the Big Apple, complete with bird's nest hair and lipstick smears. Man, that album is so groundbreaking. If you haven't heard it, go check it out. It's just sloppy, sleazy, punky, glammy, everything all in one, and they definitely had that look. Think about that. The New York Dolls released their groundbreaking debut album in 1972. 1972. That's at least 10 to 12 years before the whole glam thing broke out in L.A. So they were well beyond their years for sure. Truly groundbreaking. If there's one song you're going to listen on that album, check out Personality Crisis by the New York Dolls and it'll all be clear. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. 
prophetically titled second album Too Much Too Soon, which stripped away what vestiges of professionalism had been present on the debut, sounded like the work of a band who could barely stand upright. Never more so than on final track Human Being, a barely produced blast of hissing punk noise that buried singer David Johansson sneers and howls deep within layers of fuzzy guitars that sounded like they couldn't wait to leave the studio to get their next fix. Guns N' Roses' version buffed up the sound into something listenable, but lost in some of the originals band in the process of falling apart, anti-charm in the process. Speaking of band falling apart recordings, according to Slash, if you want to hear Guns N' Roses' version of band falling apart recording, go check out Sympathy for the Devil, their cover of the Rolling Stones song, and apparently that was when the band was at their worst, and they actually went in individually to record that song in the studio. They never were in the same spot at once, and so that, according to Slash, sounds like GNR falling apart. Raw Power by the almighty The Stooges. Stooges fan David Bowie had taken on the task of producing The Stooges' third album, Raw Power. Wow, I had no idea David Bowie produced them. Crazy. Partly hoping his own growing fame would finally help catapult them to stardom, but it wasn't to be. A combination of bad drug habits, volatile personalities, and Bowie's underpowdered production meant Raw Power barely got off the ground. The Stooges themselves fell apart a year later following a riotous final gig in which Iggy Pop took on a whole charter of Hell's Angels. But their fucked up spirit had been seeped into the very bones of rock and roll. Absolutely right. Guns N' Roses can match the Stooges for debauchery and laid down two Stooges covers for The Spaghetti Incident, an instrumental version of Down on the Street from 1970's Funhouse, and Duff McKagan's song Raw Power. The latter won the day and survives in Guns N' Roses' set list to this day, while Iggy returned the favor by having Duff appear on his most recent album, Every Loser. Ah, oh, that's cool. All right, Ain't It Fun, my personal favorite song of the album by The Dead Boys. Actually, here it's actually written Dead Boys, so there's no the. I always thought there was a the, but no, Dead Boys. Dead Boys were the troglodyte, I didn't know I needed my dictionary for this article, wing of the 70s New York punk scene. Ditching arty intellectualism, the transplanted Clevelanders were an explosion of instinct and attitude propelled by Cheetah Chrome's broken glass guitar and charisma bomb frontman's Stiv Bader's playing dumb sneer. Ain't It Fun began life as a song by Chrome's previous band, Rocket from the Tombs. In its original incarnation, it was five and a half minutes of post-Watergate nihilism with a side order of provocation. Ain't It Fun when you tell her she's just a drawled Rocket for the Tomb singer David Thomas before the track exploded into shards of noise. The Dead Boys kept the neutron star energy that burned at its heart, but added a wired edge that the original lacked, with Bader's one part Johnny Rotten and one part Sid Vicious shifting from sniveling whisper to mush-mouthed aggro in an instant. It was the Dead Boys version that Guns N' Roses used as a touchstone for their own cover. The inspiration came via ex-Hanoi Rocks frontman Mike Monroe, a friend of both Bader's and Axl Rose. When Axl told Monroe he wasn't familiar with the Dead Boys, Monroe made him a cassette. We were driving around Hollywood in Axel's car when Ain't It Fun came on. Axel said, wow, this is a great song. Monroe, who appeared on the finished version, told Classic Rock. He immediately called Slash and said, let's get the band together. We're covering this Dead Boy song. Man, I'm so glad he did. This is such a phenomenal song. My band used to cover this song all the time at live shows, and it was such a fun song to play and sing. Man, go check it out if you haven't heard of it. Buick McCain, in parenthesis, Big Dumb Sex. T-Rex slash Soundgarden. Mark Boland described T-Rex's Buick McCain as Zep Rex. A nod to the fact that it was heavier than a cosmic dandy glam rock that had propelled Boland's group to fame. GNR took it one step further with their version of the 1973 song from T-Rex's The Slider album, dropping in a burst of Soundgarden's Big Dumb Sex towards the end. The latter was a curious choice. Soundgarden's Big Dumb Sex, which appeared on 1989's Louder Than Love, was a mocking takedown of what guitarist Kim Thayil called butt rock and stupid music. It's not clear whether they had Guns N' Roses in mind when they wrote it, although in his defense, Axel had been a cheerleader for the Soundgarden long before the rest of the world caught on. When in a 1989 interview, Rolling Stone asked him who he'd been listening to, he replied, I enjoy Soundgarden. This singer just buries me. He made good on his fandom by inviting the Seattle band to open for GNR and Metallica on their co-headlining tour in 1991. Wow, I actually saw that tour in Montreal in the Olympic Stadium, but instead of Soundgarden, it was Faith No More opening up for them. For those of you who may not know or may not remember, there was a huge ride in Montreal for that tour. I was actually at that concert, so if you want to hear my story, I actually came up with a little video on that, so 
I'm gonna put it in this video so you can just check it out later. Hair of the Dog by Nazareth. Yes. Wow, another great song. I'm telling you, this album is a bomb. When Scottish rockers Nazareth told their label A&M that they planned to call their new album Son of a B they got a swift response. They went, no, you can't do that. We won't be able to sell it, says bassist Pete Agnew. We went, hang on, if John Wayne can say it, why can't we? But they weren't having it. Agnew still calls the 1975 album and its barreling title track Son of a Bitch Today, although the rest of the world knows it as Hair of the Dog, a play on their hair, H-E-I-R, of the dog itself a twist on that original title. That song featuring singer Dan McCafferty's wind tunnel vocal, a killer talk box guitar solo from guitarist Manny Charlton, and more cowbell than is legal in some US states, is a tale of an alluring but devious woman who finally meets her match. Now you're messing with a son of a McCafferty howls gleefully. The song caught the attention of a young Axl Rose whose rasping howls sailed close to McCafferty's. Axel enlisted Manny Charlton to produce an early pre-Appetite for Destruction demo, but the guitarist grumbled that he couldn't get all of the band to the studio at the same time. When Nazareth played half a dozen dates in California in April 1988, Guns N' Roses turned up to all of them. They were nice kids, says Agnew, very polite. It was no surprise that they chose to cover Hair of the Dog on the Spaghetti Incident. It's good, but they didn't really do too much with it, Agnew says of Guns N' Roses' version of his own band song. We had great success covering other people's songs, but we always put our own stamp on it. I think Axel just wanted to sing Son of a Bitch. <laughs> All right, Attitude by The Misfits, another iconic band. It was Metallica, not Guns N' Roses, who put America's greatest cult punk band back on the map five years after they split. Metallica's 1987 mashup of New Jersey horror punk's Misfits' Last Caress, what a crazy song, and Green Hell introduced the Glenn Danzig-fronted band to a generation of thrash kids. Junior may have been late out of the gate with their own Misfits cover, but they picked a doozy. Attitude was a rush of catchy, goth-tinged punk and roll that appeared on the B-side of the New Jersey's band 1978 single Bullet. Misfits looked like a bunch of gravediggers at a Halloween party, pretty accurate description, <laughs> with thick black eyeliner and distinctive devil locks. Fringes stalled forward into a point that hung down their chins. We weren't drug shooting beatnik Bowery boys, founding bassist Jerry only says. That's why we came up with the horror thing. We loved horror films, sci-fi, B-movies. Attitude wasn't a horror punk track so much as a blast of pure, well, attitude. When we did the lines, I got some f***ing attitude. Nobody was saying f quote unquote, every second word in 1978 says only. Back then we were doing that to be socially obnoxious. Attitude was lined up to appear on Misfits debut album, Static Age, but labeled disinterest and an acrimonious split with Danzig meant the record remained unreleased until 1987, four years after GNR hopped on the Misfits bandwagon. Today, Danzig and Only have patched up their differences and are again playing under the Misfits name, headlining festivals and arenas. America's greatest cult punk band are a cult no longer. Black Leather by the Sex Pistols. Yeah, I'm so glad they didn't go with the obvious and overplayed Anarch in the UK. Black Leather might be credited to the Sex Pistols, but the band that recorded it wasn't just unrecognizable from the one that had made, never mind the Bullocks, they didn't even exist by the time it snuck out in 1980. After Johnny Ron left following a disastrous US tour in January 1978 to form PIL, P -I -L, manager Malcolm McLaurin urged guitarist Steve Jones, drummer Paul Cook, and doomed bassist Sid Vicious to carry on without the talismanic singer. In the spring of 1978, this rump Sex Pistols entered the studio to record a grab bag of songs for the soundtrack to an entertainingly shambolic film come art statement McLaren was planning called The Great Rock and Roll Swindle. Among them was Black Leather, a bondage fixated slap of buffed up rock and roll with Jones on vocals and bass as well as guitar. The first the world heard of Black Leather was when it was covered by LA Punk's The Runaways on their 1978 album and now dot 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 The Runaways. Perversely, McLaren opted to drop the Jones slash Cook version from the great rock and roll swindle when the film was released in 1980. Instead, it slipped onto the seven inch singles collection, Pistols Pack, by which time Jones and Cook had formed their new band, The Professionals. The seeds of that group were undeniably in black leather. By the end of the 1980s, Jones had relocated to LA and released two solo albums, Mercy and Fire and Gasoline, the latter including a version of another pistol semi-obscurity I Did You No know Wrong. And singing backing vocals on that cover, Axl Rose. All right, next song up, You Can't Put Your Arms Around a Memory. 
of course, by the late great Johnny Thunders. Steve Lillywhite was 23 years old and barely out of the gate career-wise when he signed on to co-produce Johnny Thunders' debut solo album, So Alone, in early 1978. As a staff producer at Island Records, he worked with the John Fox-fronted Ultravox and Eddie and the Hot Rods, but inelegantly wasted ex-New York Dolls and Heartbreakers guitarist was a different prospect altogether. Johnny was friends with my roommate, and so I got to know him, Lady White tells Classic Rock. The Heartbreakers album, 1977's LAMF, didn't sound great, so I said, let me do your soul album. I'll guarantee you get a good sounding record. Of course, I was bluffing completely. <laughs> Lily White and Thunders entered the fallout shelter, a studio in the dingy basement of Island's West London offices. It was this funky old studio with no natural light, says Lily White. It was a perfect way to record Johnny Thunders. Thunders was deep in a grip of heroin addiction. The guitarist and well-connected manager, B.P. Fallon, recruited a stellar cast list to play on the album, including Phil Linnett, Steve Marriott, Sex Pistols duo Steve Jones and Paul Cook, and Only One's frontman Peter Parrott. It was Parrot himself, no stranger to the needle, who would help bring the album's standout track and the highlight of Thunder's solo career to life. You Can't Put Your Arms Around a Memory was a broken down ballad that found its strung out New York alley cat at his most vulnerable. Peter helped me understand the sort of person Johnny was, said Lily White. Get him today, Steve, because he's not hurting. He's on good form. Also playing on the track were Eddie and the Hot Rods bassist Paul Gray and Only One's drummer Mike Kelly. Parrot provided guitar and backing vocals, although you can't put your hands around a memory was pure thunders. Part junkie confessional, part snarl of defiance, it was the sound of a man writing his epitaph. It would be thunders fanatic Duff McKagan who sang on GNR's cover of the song, adding an impromptu tribute to the guitarist who died of drug-related causes in 1991. That song doesn't sound perfect by modern thinking, Lily White says of the original. Some might say the guitar is out of tune, but that's why it resonates so well. There's a humanity to it. From all the interviews I've seen with Duff McKagan, he's a huge Johnny Thunders fan. He even tries to emulate him and sing like him. If you check out a lot of the Duff's uh, solo albums, he definitely has that Johnny Thunders vibe for sure. I Don't Care About You, yeah, one of my favorites on the album, by Fear. Even by the standards of LA's early punk scene, Fear thrived on provocation. They were formed by jazz and blues loving ex-soldier Lee Capillero, who moved across country to California and reinvented himself as Lee Ving and as an American punk's button pusher in chief. Fear's 1983 debut album, The Record, was a satirical dissection of modern American culture, poking fun at everything from artsy hipsters to left-leaning punk rockers. The bluntly titled I Don't Care About You wrapped up their whole ethos in two minutes of roaring rock and roll. I Don't Care About You, f you. Ving brawled on a chorus, although a weird kind of compassion shone through when he sang I've seen an old man have a heart attack in Manhattan. Well, he died while we just stood there looking at him. Cynical or empathetic? Question mark. Maybe Guns N' Roses noticed a little bit of both in it. Okay, the last track of the album actually was a hidden track. So back then, if you bought the cassette or CD, it, the track wasn't really written anywhere. You had to discover the track by letting the tape or CD run. These days with streaming, you can't really do hidden tracks anymore. It's just right there. Look at your game, girl. Charles Manson. In the late 60s, Charles Manson pursued two parallel careers, one as a musician, the other as a racist, psychopathic cult leader. Unfortunately for the seven people who died at the hands of his followers, he was more successful at the latter than the former. Although that didn't stop him amassing a stockpile of songs they hoped would turn him into a star. Among them was Look At Your Game Girl, a pared down acoustic track that sounded like the work of a fifth rate LA troubadour. Written in 1968, the song remained on the shelf for a couple of years when it was opportunistically released as a single just as Manson and his acolytes went on trial for murder. Axl Rose discovered the track on the 1970 album Lie, colon, The Love and the Terror Cult and figured Manson's status as an American anti-hero chimed with his bands. The decision to cover it as an uncredited bonus track on the Spaghetti Incident backfired. The outrage that greeted it prompted the band to donate performance royalties to an environmental charity. But it was too little too late. An album that was conceived with the noblest of intentions ended on a sour note. And that is the article. You know, sour note or not, that album I think is huge in the sense that it should get credit for introducing people, the masses like myself, to bands that we had no clue about, to all these punk bands. 
GNR was my favorite band to come out of the 80s. Appetite for Destruction was released in 1987. And obviously in 1990s, they were huge and they were one of my favorite bands for sure. But these punk bands that they highlight, I mean, I had no clue. And I'm sure 99% of the people out there had no clue about these bands. And they just turned us on to them. Man, and you know, GNR deserves all the credit to that. As you know, it's all about standing on the shoulders of giants, right? It's not about you. It's about what came before you or influenced you. And this is GNR's way of demonstrating that, highlighting the bands that influenced them. All right. Well, there you go. Thanks for listening and sticking to the end. Hopefully, this was very informative for you. Hopefully, you learned a thing or two or three or four. I, I know I certainly did. I had no idea about any of the backgrounds of these songs. So it's really cool to see. Hopefully, you found value in this. If you did, please like and subscribe. It really means a lot to me and really helps out the channel. And don't forget, check out this album, crank it out one louder, and I'll see you in the next episode.